REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It is an architecture that became very popular in building web APIs. It was the dissertation of Roy Fielding and it is basically his baby and uh, you can see a lot of article of him online getting really mad because people took this thing and made it into a monster. <laughs> so he's very vocal about what REST API should look like and he invented the concept of RESTful API, right? So you, you see he's uh, he gets mad really quick and if people does their stuff wrong and uh, it took me a while to find a rest api that is actually restful i wish he actually provided an example for us to what restful should look like but i'm gonna take you my i give, give you my take in this video you you decide by yourself but let's just jump into it guys all right so if you're new here Welcome, my name is Hussein, and in this channel we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. If you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing, hit that bell icon so you get notified when I make a new video. Uh, with that said, let's just jump into this video, guys. All right, so this is the agenda for today. We're going to talk about the REST API, what is it, right? And, and we're going to talk about these two portions of it, right, that fielding. Uh, called it right so he named that rest which is stands for representational state transfer the first two letters of representational right and the state transfer concept right so we're going to talk about that right representational state transfer wrist constraints what are the constraints that is set by him okay essentially what what makes a constraint rest he says okay you can make any api but don't call it rest call it rpc right it's not, it's not really rest okay he just gets really mad when you call your api rest when it's not in fact rest right and i understand it's, just, it's his baby right he created it and yeah uh whatever so rest constraints right we're going to talk about that and we're going to show you what i believe is a restful api right based on all those constraints i think it is Okay, get API, and I'm I didn't forget to add a bullet here. I'm gonna take talk to about the hopefully the limitation of REST API and uh, why Facebook invented GraphQL to replace the REST API because there was certain limitation, right? I'm not saying that REST API is bad, guys. Don't don't twist my words, but Facebook essentially. So there is one piece of the constraint that they didn't like, and they invented a whole new technology called GraphQL that replaces REST essentially. Okay, and there and that's the backend. And there's a lot of adoption. I'm not saying that it's a replacement. It really depends on your use case. Let's just jump into the video, guys. Okay, representations and state transfer. What what is what that what does that mean? Okay, so when we say representations here, is that when you create an API at the backend, okay that represent a resource, let's say users, okay? You give me those users in a representation. Usually this is JSON, but it could be protocol buff. There is some discussion that this is bad. This breaks one of Fielding's constraints as well because he doesn't like a strongly typed defined user because the moment you strongly type your resources, then it's not REST, it's based on him. But essentially, let's say this is JSON flexible, dynamic but so you get your users on a JSON format but the back end is essentially could be stored in any format could be it could be a CSV file obviously not it could be a Postgres database and a table it could be a MongoDB uh, collection right it could be anything right but the user the trick here is your representation you change the representation of a resource right it is decoupled of whatever the storage mechanism or that actual resource is you change the representation into json xml anything else okay essentially and uh, you host it on the http right so it's the http protocol so that's essentially what the rest is the second but that's the first part of the representation so any resource is a representation of the back end whatever that is okay the users is Maybe it's a bunch of tables or rows. There's a join, but when the user sees or the consumer of this sees, it's a sense of a representation of that thing. Okay, so it's a JSON document. We're gonna talk about that. State transfer. We're talking about the concept of stateless and stateful. I'm gonna reference the video here because, but in a nutshell, 
the server, the REST API should not store any state on the server application. It can store states on some other services like databases. That's okay. But don't store information in memory and rely on it being there. So what does that mean? That means that the client is owning that state. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick story that happened to me here. I don't know if everybody will relate to that, but when I first came to the States in 2015, I came on an H1B visa, okay? And uh, for some reason, I had to go to the DMV every three months to renew my driving license because stupid rules, okay? So I had, now I have a green car, so... Yeah, I'm good now. <laughs> but when I had to go to the DMV and drive, I had to bring, okay, all my documents with me every single time, okay? Because that operator that I, I go, usually go to is different, okay? Right? So I bring all of my stuff with me and they look me up and they reissue me a new driving license, okay? If Sometimes there was a period of, I think in the year 2016, I went multiple times, I went to the same operator. They said, you know what, you don't have to bring everything, just call me and when you come, I'll just, just come to me directly. When I do that, when I did that, I went to that guy, okay, and immediately I go to him, he was immediately, he'll just, I don't give him anything, he would just know me. Somehow you see my face and it was just know me. Oh, yeah, it's like let's just generate you a new license. Like, sorry, yeah, your legal status is not there. So it's just and then done. Okay, so what happens here is the first approach versus the second approach. The second approach is faster, the first approach is slower. Okay, but here's the differences. Now we're gonna bring it all back into the stateless here and stateful, okay? The first approach where I bring my old document to a new agent every time is the stateless, where I don't care at the back end whether it's stateful, uh, whether it's a new agent or not. I'm bringing my documents all the time, every time, okay? The second approach is the stateful approach. So that guy actually stores some sort of a state. They know me, okay, by just looking at me, Okay, that could be your session ID or something, just one thing coming from you. And it knows, he knows, right, that it's me and they, they pick the information immediately and they generate it, okay? That's the stateful. So the problem with the stateful is if that guy is gone, I'm screwed, right? Because I, I fail. If I didn't bring any documents with me, I, I went to that guy and he's not there. He got restarted. Or crashed right if he's not or fired if I go to that guy then I cannot do anything he says sorry nobody can help you because you don't have your documents with you right so the, I failed my request failed okay so that's the difference between stateless and stateful hopefully it makes sense right so state transfer is me bringing all my documents every time with me okay so the rest is a stateless protocol so that's the first approach where yes it is slower correct you are right is even in this architecture it is slower okay because you have to bring everything with you so more bandwidth you have to query the back end most of the time right you have to invalidate caches most of the time okay so the stateless approach yes it is but it is it has this limitation but the good thing about it it works and it scales because if you have the document, you don't care about what agent gonna serve you, okay? And you can take this example with a, your primary doctor, right, guys? Okay, American, everyone has a primary doctor. You go to the primary doctor and it's not there. She's not there. Imagine that, okay? It's, you're gonna have to bring your documents, right? Or tell it, hey, by the way, this is my ID and just pulls it from information. So that's stateless versus stateless. I hope that makes sense, right? Sorry for the long description, but. I like giving that example because a lot of people relate to it. not the immigration part of it, but you, you get the idea, right? So, so that's what used to happen to me, right? Essentially. So that state, state transfer. So state transfer, every request, bring it all back, circle, all circle. Every request that comes to the server has to carry as much information about the state as possible, okay? And th this means that this is a, this means 
if you make a request to a load balancer, right, and the load balancer decide to to shift you to another server, that's completely okay because you have all this stuff with you. The server can rebuild that state on the fly and then construct who you are, can query databases if it needs to, query does stuff, and then continue working normally, okay? That, so that's the idea, essentially, of a state transfer, okay? So representational and state transfer. So it has, the rest has to be stateless. It has to be stateless, okay? So that's essentially, in a nutshell, hope that makes sense, right? So, and uh, if I'm gonna take an example of that, like if you make a request, like let's say you're gonna upload a file, or this like, an actual application example here. If I'm gonna upload a file, for instance, and that file is a five megabyte, right? Most of the time, this is a stateful operation because you're gonna chunk it up into, like say, oh, I don't know, five segments, five chunks of one megabyte each, right? And you're gonna upload that. If you upload segment number one, it goes to one server, stores it. If that server stores it in the same server, you're screwed, right? Because if that second segment goes to another server, what the heck does that mean, right? That server died, right? Let's say the ser server one died and server two is now taking the second segment. So that's, that's another stateful operation. That's bad. So what you need to do to make it stateless is if I send you segment number one or chunk number one, you store it in an S3 bucket or you store it somewhere else, okay? And that's it, you're done, you've done your job, okay? And I send you segment number two, same thing. If whether it's you or server one or server two or server three, they're gonna store it somewhere else, right? They are just the facilitator, they're the proxy that just takes your request, does the thing, maybe compress it, maybe does the thing, and then store it. And then the final request, the server knows, that, oh, this, is this the final request? Yes, it is the final request. I'm gonna store it in the S3 bucket or a database, doesn't have to be S3. And then once you do that, it will assemble all of that stuff and, and create the whole file and then return the, to the user that success. That's an example of a stateless operation as well, okay? So you can always build stateful, stateless. There is advantage and disadvantage. I talked about the video here. Go watch it if you're interested. Let's talk about the constraint and then jump into an example, guys. All right, so constraint here is a, a client server architecture. It has to be a client server, right? Uh, where there is a separation of concern, where the server can be in a server version and the client could be at a completely different version and they should communicate normally. If you upgrade the server, the client should should can stay in the same version or can be upgraded based on the server uh, the server drives that essentially okay so there's a separation of concern if you upgrade the server the back end for example we talked about the again backs to the representation if your json document right that returns the list of users this endpoint returns the list of users and then the back end is a postgres database and you decided to upgrade to i don't know it's mysql for some reason guess what the applications will work, should work normally. They don't even know that happened. You know why? Because of the representational, right? And then there's a separation of concern. Client server. Statelessness. We talked about that for, I think, five minutes straight. You know now it's, it has to be stateless, right? Server, I can go ahead and restart the server while I am connected as a client and my next request should be served normally if there is another available server, okay? Cacheability. I should be able to cache resources, and this should be uh, derived by the server, kind of right. So the server can tell me if this resource can be cached, when it can, when can I use it, when I can't, when it's stale, all of that stuff, right? And e tags is a perfect example for that. E tags caching. I'm gonna reference the video we did on e tags, HTTP e tags, and how caching works with that. Layered system, we talked about proxy, we talked about reverse proxy, we talked about NAT, all of that stuff. REST should work normally when you insert proxies in the middle and caching layers in the middle. Should work just normally, loading balancer, okay? So if I insert a reverse proxy that load balances my request, your system better work. It should not be a, a direct way of, of, of like knowing that relying on a single TCP connection essentially it should uh, the HTTP protocols should support proxying which it does 101 right 11 starts support proxy HTTP 10 didn't but we added the host 
header and that start support that so yeah you can add start adding middle gateways and proxies without things broken essentially in the process uniform interface uh, this is the URI part of the thing. So you have an URL and URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. And uh, that's like slash, for example, user slash one. Okay, and we're going to show examples on that. We're going to show about, uh, we're going to talk about this concept of hate OS, which is the hyper, stands for hyper media as the engine of application state and we're going to talk about that where and that's the reason one of the constraint that facebook started moving to a graphql right because that model didn't work for them and what what essentially what it is is you ask one rest endpoint for your essentially that portal endpoint and that tells you all the urls that you need Okay, you it will. Okay, I'm gonna show that example in a minute. Okay, you're gonna show. I'm gonna show you the list of all the rest endpoints. Like, hey, this is where you get your followers. This is where you get your emojis. This is where you get your users. This is this rest endpoint you get all this stuff. That our client doesn't hard code any URL, and it's and only the first one, which is the main gate one, gateway, right? The rest are just derived by, so the, derived by the application state in this case, which is all the hypermedia, okay? And as you can see, the limitation of this, the limitation of this is, imagine Facebook, right? And if, if an application needs to go, for example, give me all the users and their likes, you have to find first, you have to call facebook.com, right? API.facebook.com to find the API, right? API if to find the user's endpoint. Once you have the user's endpoint, uh, what, game, what are you gonna do? Essentially, you get back, you make another call to the user's endpoint. Once you get the user's endpoint, you make another end, you get the URL for the likes and you make another request for the likes, okay? And you can see those round trips that kills the bandwidth and kills the performance, right? Yes, you get this beautiful, nice uh, scalability and evolvability as, as uh, uh, Fielding calls it, but you just killed performance, my friend, right? Because of all this chattiness that happens, right? Facebook invented GraphQL says, no, I'm not gonna do that, I'm sorry. I'm gonna make a request. I'm gonna tell you what I need. I need the user and I need these likes and I need these followers. With the request, with this syntactical sugar, uh, using this GraphQL language, we, we're gonna make a. Hopefully, we're gonna make a, another video about just GraphQL, and then we're gonna just make that request, and you do the thing on the back end, right? Query, join, all that stuff, and give me one representation. Give me the final result. I'm not gonna do seven hundred REST endpoint calls just to get you, just to get that result back. All right. All right, let's just show some examples, guys. All right, guys, so we're gonna show you how REST API works here as an example. And I don't want you to install anything on your machine. You can do this right now on your laptop, okay? You can do that on any machine. You can go to a library and do this, what I'm gonna tell you, without installing a single app. Right, you can call this and, and navigate call JavaScript code right now. And all you need is a browser. Chrome or Firefox will work. I'm using Chrome and let's show some REST API, guys. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do go to a Chrome and then click on this button, burger tools. I think it's called a burger button for some reason. And then call to developer tools. Once you have developer tools, let's expand it here because we're gonna write code. Click on console. This is your code, guys. We can write code here. We can write console.log. Hello, right? Less boring, okay? You can just print stuff. So here's what I wanna do. I want to make a request to the, I'm showing you just the REST API of the GitHub API, essentially. And I'm gonna show you the hate OS, or I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That, that, uh, that, application engine that we talked about right but here's an, uh, the rest api right so i'm gonna do a fetch request here against https api.github.com 
That's the only thing you need to remember, okay? And then when you get the result back, you're expecting JSON, okay? So I'm gonna do that. JSON, a.json, give me back the JSON, and then just then console.log. So if you were wondering what then and fetch uh, is actually, what you want to do is essentially just go to this video that I'm gonna reference here and then check out that, check out that video. Okay, guys, uh, I, I talked about fetch API and all that stuff, I'm gonna reference it here. All right, so if I make that request, look at that, guys. I just got back a result, and guess what? It is a list of all the other API URLs that you need to do, okay, that you need to access. That's how REST API should look like, okay? It, you, you access one endpoint, and it tells you where to go next, right? You can access everything. I'm interested in this U URL, user URL. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and copy it. Usually your application will just drive already, print it or do something with that. But here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to make a request to that. And instead of user here, this is where you put your actual username or any username. I'm gonna put my username here. Okay, and then do the same thing. A, A to JSON, and just print it. Don't do anything fancy with it, just print it. Show you the rest endpoint. Okay, look at that, that's me, right? This is your bio software engineer, author, YouTuber, and gamer. Yes, I love video games. I just like third person kind of uh, view of games like Bloodborne, Dark Souls, action gamers. I like God of War, I like Red Dead Redemption, these kind of games. I'm not, I'm not good in Fortnite on all these first person shooter games like Call of Duty, I'm bad at those. But yeah, so, when we get this, that's a fancy thing. So I want what I want to get next is my followers list, okay? And guess what? That's another URL. You can just get that and then make a request to that and get you the followers URL. And you can see that there will be chatting. If you were just interested in my followers, you will have to do all these hoops to jump through all of that stuff just to get me through that. Okay, so it will be a little bit more work for you just to get it. So let's get my followers. How do I get my followers? Okay, once I get that uh, rest endpoint, I can do fetch, then let's paste this, right? And then do then a, a to JSON, and then then console.log. Just print it, just print it for me. Okay, what are my followers? Who is my followers? Look at that, all my followers. Love you guys. Thank you so much. All right, this is follows on GitHub, not YouTube though, guys. That is YouTube APIs, as in this is almost the same, similar. But yeah, this is essentially how REST API looks like, guys, right? So this is very, in a nutshell, right? I'm going to reference another video that we made here, guys, to talk about the uh, how to write content, how to post, create all that stuff. I'm going to I'm gonna reference a video here that we made. It's, it's basically how uh, we... We have a Postgres database, and then we build the REST API to, to be, essentially build a to-do list. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to reference that video. With that said, guys, hope you enjoyed this content. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. So let's get ahead and do some summary. All right, guys, summary. All right, what are we going to do? We discussed the representational, which we discussed what a representation is. We discussed what a state transfer is. We discussed the, all the rest constraints and how you should abide by those constraints and what can get you, what they don't get you, right? All the things that can get you, right? It depends really on your use case to, to use rest or not, right? You can use good old RPC, just have a Node.js that returns your stuff. It doesn't have to be rest. Rest is not perfect, guys. Don't get attached to things just because they are popular right same can same same thing kind of uh, apply to any technology out there do you want to get attached to anything just because it's popular well this was popular in 2000 2005 ish era now it's not much i mean it is still being used obviously it is getting more and more popular but there's limitations obviously for everything and everything will get evolved this is how software engineering works. You're gonna work technology, we're gonna continue improving the technology, we're gonna improve everything. If there's something that is bad 
or there is a certain use case that this particular technology doesn't work anymore, we're going to improve it. Guess what? We're going to improve it. We're going to replace it with something new. GraphQL replaced REST for certain workflows, right? And a lot of people are moving that way, right? I think the New York Times have moved. Facebook, obviously, they invented that technology, right? But a lot of people are happy with REST. So it's up to you. You can take REST, change a little bit to fit your needs, to fit your needs and make it work for you. All right, guys, we also showed an example of how GitHub works. Well, also, I'm going to reference a video just for if you're interested in writing your REST API from scratch. We did that as well. Hope you enjoyed this video, guys. If you like this video, give it a like. And uh, I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome.